I don't remember his name, but I will never forget the email address he left on the sign-in sheet, betchaican at gmail.com. Such a positive, uplifting username for someone whose life was obviously in the midst of a downward spiral. Betcha I Can came to one of our veterans writing group meetings a while back. It wasn't exactly what he had planned to do that morning when he walked into the community room. Back then we met right next to the police department in Oceanside, which for some unknown economic reason was closed on Saturdays and provided an interesting mix of people wandering in our doors. Betcha I Can looked about 21 or 22 years old as he stood in the doorway asking for spare change to use the pay phone right outside. In rapid fire explosion of words, he told me that he didn't have a cell phone and he really needed to call his friend because he had no place to stay and his other friend's wife or maybe it was his girlfriend had kicked him out. His voice rose in volume as he described the places he had stayed and the shit, his word, that happened to him over the last couple of months. He finished his chronicle by saying things were just really fucked up. Obviously, plus you're high on something. He was hurting and I was, I admit, fearfully uncomfortable. Looking back, I regretted that I judged him on his appearance and his choice of horrifying down and out vignettes to share. To his credit, he was rather polite in his own way. But there he was, meth-infused eyes, crop blonde hair, muscle tattooed arms exposed by a wife beater, t-shirt blocking the only exit. Then in a literal blink of his eye and a panic beat of my heart, he asked in a relatively calm voice what we were doing in the room. I said it was the veterans writing group meeting and we'd start soon. I like to write, is it free, do you have to join? He said again with that rat-a-tat-tat -tat delivery. Yes, it's free, you just have to be a veteran, I asked, wishing the rest of the group would arrive soon. Betchai Khan said he didn't have his DD-214 with him. He just got out of the Navy and all his stuff is at his dad's in Fallbrook and he can't go back there because he's not speaking to his dad ever again. Something about stuff in the attic, things being solar, stolen, and some motherfucker all up in his face. <laughs> he wasn't making much sense, but only a vet would know the term DD-214, so I told him we didn't need to see his discharge papers and he's welcome to stay. Yeah, and I have all these notebooks. And with that, he bolted out of the room. The group arrived and we began our meeting. I truly thought the young man probably forgot about coming back. But a few minutes later, in walked Betcha I Can, wearing a clean short sleeve button down shirt and carrying a stack of notebooks. I was thankful for that gesture. To me, putting on a shirt meant he still had some dignity and pride, despite his trouble and erratic demeanor. He had hope. Our mentor from the Writers Guild Foundation encouraged lots of discussion, but Betcha I Can just couldn't settle down. He kept wiggling in his seat and saying random comments to those around him. He sat in the only squeaky chair in the room and made quite a racket when his <laughs> notebooks fell and he struggled to pick them up. The mother in me was concerned about his well-being, but I also wanted to shout a very <coughs> unmotherly, shut the fuck up and stop squirming around, but I didn't. His mumbling and jittering continued to distract the guys next to him, but no one moved away. There seemed to be a noticeable atmosphere of patience and tolerance in the room towards that young man. There were a lot of OIF, OEF, and Vietnam veterans at that meeting, and perhaps they recognized the hurt and the confusion he was feeling. One of the younger vets who sat to his left leaned over and, with a smile and calmly said something to him. I couldn't hear what it was, but it seemed to settle Betcha I Can down. Maybe veterans continued to look after each other in civilian life as they did in uniform. Maybe Betcha I Can was being ignored as one would a child's tantrum or maybe no one wanted to tangle with someone coming down from a drug high. The mentor then asked if anyone had something they would like to read. Betcha I Can's hand shot up. This should be interesting, I thought. But what this young man couldn't convey la lucidly with his spoken words, he could with his written ones. He read one short story using a butterfly as a metaphor for his sister, whom he obviously loved and felt he needed to protect. And then completely changing emotional directions, he shared a story about being beat up recently by some guys from his ship when they were, were downtown. He thought they were his friends, but realized they weren't after the evening's excursion went awry. Naturally, a woman and alcohol were involved, and he ended up with a bleeding gash on his head. When it was all over, he felt no anger towards his friends. They did what they had to do, 
he said, reading the last line. His stories were raw and unpublished, but they were also passionate and insightful. I held back tears as he read some passages and laughed at others. Betchai Kan's writing style impressed our mentor, who urged him to keep writing and to transfer his stories to a computer since some of his notebooks had already been lost, stolen, or left behind in places he stayed. I wanted to reach out and hug that wounded little boy and tell him everything would be all right. Young Betchai Kan was wrestling in a troubled sea, and mothers make good lifeguards. I wondered where his own mother was and why she was not taking better care of her son. But families are complicated, and he is a grown man after all. I wanted to help in some way. Naively, I thought he might listen to my motherly tough love advice and wisdom, despite the fact that my own daughter was going through a difficult time and she wasn't listening to me. <laughs> For the rest of the meeting, I practiced in my mind how I would connect with him after the class. Here was my plan. I'd corner him, block his exit, and have him tremble with fear, with fear from this mother talker all up in his face. I'd be like Cher in that movie Moonstruck when she slapped Nicolas Cage's face and said, snap out of it. But he was probably two years old when that movie came out, so I doubt he would understand or appreciate my reenactment. And this is what I would tell him. Do you know how lucky you are to be 20-something years old? You have all of life's wonder, opportunities, and possibilities ahead of you. Use the GI Bill and get an education. If you're hurting, seek help. Know that many people are dedicated to making sure you are healthy and happy and whole. I don't know what you did in the Navy, but you had adventures, experiences, and gained a worldview few of your generation have. You have stories to share. You will no doubt be the most interesting person in a room full of your civilian peers. I know, I have a daughter your age, and trust me, some of her guy friends are not all that interesting. <laughs> Do something with your life before you become a cliche, or worse, a statistic. You're good looking, but a tweaker. And by staying high, you will lose that nice complexion and all those white teeth will rot out. That muscle mass holding up your tats will soon shrivel, and that skin canvas of beautiful, painful artwork will melt together like crayons left out in the sun. When class was over, I did get right in his face, but I froze. I was only able to say the lamest phrase ever. Stop taking drugs and do something with your life. Some mother I am. Even as he mumbled, yeah, I know. He knew, I knew, he didn't know. And then he walked away. I can't really blame him for blowing me off. I'm sure to him I was just some middle-aged woman about to drone on and kill his buzz. He was, after all, an adult who had gone to war. And hell, my own generation didn't trust anyone over 30. In the end, we gave Betcha I can the rest of the pretzels and a few bottles of water, left him standing outside the community room with his backpack in a shopping cart waiting for some friend to pick him up. My last words to him were, you're a good man, take care of yourself and do great things. I didn't know what else to say and wasn't really pleased that that was all I could come up with. I wish we could have done more, perhaps take him to interfaith shelter or a homeless facility, but we never thought to have that information handy. We do now, just in case. My partner in the writing group, John, a retired Marine, is such a good guy that every time he drove down Mission Boulevard, he looked to see if he could find him and offer help. Leave no man behind. John never did find him. I often wonder whatever became of Betcha I can. Is he disheveled, disillusioned, getting high in the back streets of Oceanside? Or maybe he's sitting in a classroom at Miracosta College or Cal State San Marcos writing his stories. Perhaps he leans over and slips this cute, smart girl sitting next to him his email address, betcha I can, at gmail.com. This is my hope, but most stories don't have happy endings. Broken lives cannot be mended by some feel-good non sequiturs, no matter how lovingly given. And homes are not always happy and welcoming. Sadly, betcha I can probably join scores of homeless vets in San Diego on any given night, adding to the ranks of thousands of civilian homeless. And that is the more tragic story. Thank you.